Hey, what's up? I am Mike Squires, and this is Couchers Podcast, episode number 156. I'm my guest, Rusty Willoughby. Uh, Rusty Willoughby, not a household name, but sort of a hidden gem. Best kept secret of Seattle has been putting out records since the 80s with Pure Joy, Flop, Llama. Um, he has uh, put out some solo material, Cobirds Unite, and all of it great. Uh, a very mellow dude. We had a great time talking. Then we got interrupted in the middle of our conversation. I had a fire call. Um, that was it happens sometimes gets in the way of the podcast but this is uh you know this is the way the bee bumbles you know what i'm saying uh i had a great time talking with rusty i hope you enjoy this conversation as much as i did if you're enjoying the couchers podcast please consider at least consider supporting us at patreon patreon.com slash couch riffs that's the only place you can get the uh downloads for the audio the cover songs that we do um there's some other stuff going on i'm working on some custom merch for patreon people i'm really you know i'm working on some new designs and stuff so um thank you to everyone who's been supporting i really appreciate it it gets me one step closer to all of the very ambitious concepts that i have for couch riffs and uh enables uh, me to focus more of my energy on this and less on things that i don't want to focus my energy on if you dig my drift so thank you i appreciate you thank you for listening thank you for sharing thank you for commenting send me emails couchdrifts at gmail.com questions if you have uh suggestions people you want to see on the show whatever Hit me up. Also, thank you to River City Guitars. River City Guitars has been supporting Couchress from the very beginning, since before the beginning. Um, since the very genesis of Couchress, River City Guitars has been with us every step of the way. Thank you to them. Uh, check out at River City Guitars on social media and rivercityguitars.com. Now, they get stuff in all the time, but They'll share it on social media and boom, it's gone before you know it. It's, it's like that. So follow them on social media at River City Guitars. Uh, River City Guitars is located in Spokane and every day is a buying day. However, you know, if you have something that you are sitting on, you don't want to sit on anymore, you want to sell it, you want to do some trading, some swapping, you've got a collection I don't know what you got, but give them a call. They're interested. And uh, just because you're not near Spokane doesn't mean it's not a possibility. My man Bobby does a lot of road work. So give him a shout, 509-818-7693, or shoot him an email, sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. Maybe tell him I sent you. It might help. They're going to treat you great anyway, but good conversation starter um i mean not as good as hey i've got this 59 less paul but uh pretty good still you know check them out thank you so much to river city guitars um don't forget the golden rule treat people the way you want to be treated imagine <laughs> imagine where what what the world would be like if that's how we operated we all operated and do your very best to not be a fucker. Huh? Hey. Can you see me? I can, I can see you. Oh, good. Can you see me? I can see and hear you. That's how I knew you were there. Because you could hear me? Because <laughs> I could see you. <laughs> how you That's doing? That's the dead giveaway. It is the dead giveaway. <laughs> If I see you, then there you are. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, remember when you used to do this, well, like you close one eye and do this and you think no one could see you because you can't see anything past your finger. I don't, I don't, I don't remember that. <laughs> Never mind. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, now I'm hiding from you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. This is a great way to kick it off. <laughs> uh, what do you got? Hey, are you, do you do one mic recordings of, of your drum set? Yes, for the most part. I've done multiple, like, um, you know, like close miking several drums on occasion. But the whole phase thing is scary to me. And so sometimes I just get one mic. I'm just doing a demo. So I just throw one mic up and then it's like, oh, it sounds okay. Right. And then it's good enough. There's nothing else going on in the room. So even if it's a one mic um, situation, it still sounds like there's still fidelity to it because there's no leaking of any other instruments or anything. Like one well-placed microphone. Does yeah. It was a fine job it will do the job what is that microphone um with this one yeah it's a aea 44 c i think is the technical thing it's like the copy of the rca 44s it looks fancy it's kind of fancy i kind of when i was employed <laughs> <laughs> fancy Remember things would appeal day? to me but it was kind of like, you know, because I, I don't have enough space and I don't collect stuff. Like, I don't like collecting stuff because once I have stuff I'm not using on a daily basis or something, it kind of freaks me out. So my idea was to get like really good, you know, get two really good mics or something, you know, as opposed to a bunch of mics. And So you have like a storage space phobia? Um, A little, I think. I th yeah, it's weird. I like collecting. I like, you know, like when I have five guitars and I put them all together and somehow that's it's like, like you have on the wall. It's like, yeah, this is kind of, yeah, these are my toys. These are, this is what, these are my tools and stuff. But if I get, like if I have, like for a while I was getting two of the same things because if you tour or play out, I would want to have a backup. And I really wasn't doing that much and having this separate set of the same things really bothered me and I shouldn't bother me. I should learn from people who just collect shit and keep it. Um, but I always get rid of stuff. Well, there's a, in the last 10 years, there's been a real movement of declutter. Like people, you hear people talking about decluttering and, uh, simplifying and getting rid of things that you don't, you know, I ever, people have different standards by which they'll purge. Right. Right. But, and it's an OCD thing, you know, like right. I, I like, I need to not be thinking about a bunch of crap. I don't have access to that. I will be afraid someone will steal or something. it's like, it's right. like, I get to a point where I think the gear kind of owns me. <laughs> yeah. like, how I long better... do you hold on to clothes though um f until they fall off me i don't i don't really well i don't i don't really have stuff i don't have a lot of clothes i have i got into this period where i'm like i wear levi's and i wear black t-shirts and black socks and black underwear throw everything in one wash nothing yep. gets ruined everything's made out of cotton so it just kind of comes back to life if you have to wash it, if you do wash it. <laughs> I have the same North Face, uh, North Face vest mm -hmm. that I bought when I was working through the cold winter down in the Pike Place Market in 1994. I've had it since 94. I've had it for 26 years. That's a good vest. It's, there's no, there are, I took, I mean, in 1994, this thing was, I don't remember. It felt like it must have been 500 bucks, but I think I bought it at REI at the old location up on Capitol Hill. Yeah. And for probably it, like 70 bucks or something. No, man, it was, it was, uh, I think it was 150 bucks, which is, oh, wow. That was a lot of dough for me. It is, you know? That's a lot. I mean, it would be a lot of dough to spend on a vest now, I think, although I'd be quicker to do it because I'm, <laughs> I'm less interested in suffering through the cold. 
but I don't have to because I still have this fucking. You list. still have that vest, and they're and REI is probably like shit. Them. We shouldn't have made those so good. Like no one's buying our new vests. Because well, I, I've taken particularly like I've I've taken good care of it because it meant something to me. It meant you know I spent a lot of dough on it. Right, right, and it's probably got its purpose. Like if you go up into the mountains or something, do you snowboard or anything? I don't do any of that stupid shit. Yeah, well, a vest like that would be good to have for that. I don't like to be cold. <laughs> I As don't I, either. Or like snowboarding, you're going to get cold. I have this thing where when I take out the fucking garbage, which is about eight yards from the front door, and I go out and it's windy, and, and I'm I'm like, I say things like, I'm so grateful I'm not home. So I'm so grateful I don't have to, to live because I'm suffering so bad in the, That's you awful. know. Yeah, it's cold and rainy and wet. Uh, you know what? This next winter, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get involved in the uh, the coats thing where you donate coats and round oh, yeah. coats. I think that's. I think I'm gonna do that. That is a good idea. Good helpful thing to do. You gotta. I mean, you gotta do some stuff. You do at least some time. Yeah, I think a lot of people. Sit, I think a lot of people have that compulsion or that impulse to help. It's like a natural impulse, but then you, you probably like you get four minutes into that thought, and you're like, "Oh, somebody must be doing this," or you know, you kind of, kind of give, let yourself off the hook. But yeah, you should. I think everyone should just like run with it. Like, oh, people need coats. Take all your coats that you're not wearing give them to somebody the biggest bummer is when you get into helping and you realize there's a bunch of red tape to jump through you can you know yeah help is regulated <laughs> yeah yeah under the guise of i suppose being more efficient you know like so that one so one guy on the corner doesn't end up with seven coats and then the guy around the corner from him doesn't get a coat or something but right the guy with the seven coats is selling them yeah, he's selling them to his friends. Yeah. I don't know. It's America, right? I guess it's, so. uh, it's rife with things wrong you're, that need fixing. You're out on Vashon. I am. That's pretty sweet. It is. I lucked out. I seriously lucked out. <clears throat> I usually luck out. That's what happens because I never plan anything or. Right stuff happens and I let it happen and then I feel lucky. Do you think you're lucky or do you think you're just open to what comes your way? Cause it's, there are Both. definitely people who are not open to anything that they are not a hundred percent in control of. And that's, that is a restrictor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of had an epiphany probably when I was 40 or something that like, I felt like all of a sudden nothing was, you know, like everything is an accident, you know, even the fact that we're all here on this weird planet and all this stuff. And it gave me permission to not be stressed out and feel like I need to be in control. And then since then, I'll just do stuff like, Hey, you want to move out to Vashon? Sure. <laughs> Where's Vashon? <laughs> i know i don't i've I'd been out here maybe twice before i moved out here my daughter did this like girl scout camp at camp um what, what is it i forget there's a camp out here but we we went to that it was like a father and daughter girl scout thing and all the fathers sleep in these cabins and all the daughters sleep together in these cabins and, and were I, you I the to, weird dad I was totally the weird dad. I was like 24 years old or 26 years old or something, you know, yeah. and all the rest of the guys were probably my age now, you know, in their fifties. Right. And, but they were all, um, <clears throat> not fun, not a fun group of dads. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was sneaking out to like smoke weed outside of my, outside of my <laughs> cabin and stuff. I was like, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm so, this is so you were bad. the too much fun dad yeah yeah and they were all, the, not enough fun. all the other dads were snoring like sawing logs and i couldn't sleep and i'm like fuck it 
Right. Everyone's asleep. You know, I felt bad because I knew there were children at the camp, <laughs> but but I didn't have any willpower. If they no knew, if they knew what the smell was, then they knew what the smell was from their folks. True. True. Whatever excuse dad has, you know, like, I got to go fix the lawnmower. You know, it always smells the same when dad goes out to the garage to fix the lawnmower. <laughs> You're out there cutting grass. Right. So like some Girl Scout smells weed and it's like, there must be somebody out here with a lawnmower. <laughs> Working on the lawnmower. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> At like two o'clock in the morning. Was that your go-to? I got to go work on the lawnmower. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I can't remember what I... I'm sure I talked to my daughter because she's now 30, what, 31, 32 years old and a parent herself. And I'm like, when did you realize I was smoking weed and stuff? And she claims not till later after she after she went off to college. Really? Yeah. But she got busted for smoking weed when she was in about eighth grade at the Folklife Festival, she smoked a joint with some friends of hers right. and got busted. So she, I know she knows what we smells like. I think she's lying. I think she knew what I was doing and didn't want to tell me. Because <laughs> she, uh, she was pinching your stash. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know you had any weed. <laughs> I grew up in a house that... Um... There were no rules. There were, I mean, I lived was, like that for many years too. There was a bong on our kitchen table. Yep. And I, I came home from school, and if I wanted to hit it, I could. No one said a word to me. Yeah, that's well. Uh, you had a similar childhood to me. Like, Pretty. I sp- lived. There was a period where I lived with my oldest brother, he who was 21 at the time. I was like 12 or 13. And my parents were, you know, dysfunctional families, whatever. I don't know where my parents might have been, but um, but he was like, just get good grades. You know, he was like, so people don't find out that, you know, because he was in the Navy and always wanted to have a party when he wasn't, you know, like working. So it was right. like part party house. And he's like, if you get good grades, no one's gonna, no one's gonna have any questions. You know, they're not gonna mess with you at school. So my thing was, I just got good grades, and then like you, like if there's some wine on the cupboard on the countertop, right? <laughs> or if I wanted to smoke weed, or if I wanted to ride my motorcycle, or hitchhike, or do whatever. You know, where were you living then? Those were the Belfair days. So that's out of the Hood Canal, Washington, Belfair, Washington. It's like right at the southern tip of the Hood Canal. Is that the sub base? Yeah, my brother was at Bangor. He was a nuclear sub dude. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was stationed there for a while. So he bought a house out in Belfair, which is pretty close. And then that's kind of when everything was going sideways and I was like, I'm moving in with you. So, so he became my at my, my, what is it? He's my, my official guardian or whatever, or until I was 18. Uh, Hey, cut it out. (laughs) So were, uh, were you, did you grow up? In before you lived with your brother, did you grow up in the Northwest or did you end up in the Northwest because your brother happened to be stationed at a Northwest sub base? No, no, we were here. I, our family moved here in 69 to Spanaway, Tacoma, Southern Tacoma, South Tacoma, I guess. You didn't go far at all, really. No, no, no. I just, um, we were there because my dad was in the va and he got stationed out in tacoma so we moved out here um and then northwest kind of you know i was like two and a half three years old so for me this was i feel like i'm a northwest native and so my brother was coming back to the northwest being stationed at bangor kind of so right it was a big it was a big deal for him to come back he was in places like florida and stuff that he hated (laughs) <laughs> right 
Nothing against Florida. I love Florida. Do you? <laughs> no. Do you though? <laughs> I'm sure that I love. I would love to be on a beach right now in sunshine. In eighty degree weather. There's a lot weather. of weird shit that goes down in Florida. That's that's the hard thing about Florida, right? Florida's kind of the exact opposite of Washington State in geog geographically in right. our country and um and culturally i think i mean maybe maybe not i mean i think that left to our own devices mm. without without regulation and people just running them like florida is the fucking run amok state that should be their <laughs> that should be their uh, motto the run amok state you know like virginia is for lovers and Washington's the Evergreen State. Yeah, yeah, the run amok state. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a lot of opportunity. The Keys are like that's the farthest south you get. The opportunity in... state. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of um, a lot of marinas to pull into in Florida. <laughs> if you got something on your boat, that's right. Uh, so. You were in in junior high school? Is that what you you were? Yeah, yeah, it was about junior high. I think going into eighth grade. Were you already playing music? No, no, I was a. I well, I was. I had made a Tupperware drum set <laughs> that I practiced on often. Uh -huh. I had still remember it was there were key pieces. I had a there was a little stool that I put a cookie drying rack with some chains from my sister's jewelry box and I'd hit it and that was the hi-hat. Go ch -ch 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 -ch, and then I had these, um, so I was playing Tupperware drums from about age nine, <laughs> but it didn't occur to me. It wasn't until later that I, we started like, it was probably around that period, eighth grade or so that we started accumulating real instruments. Was your brother also playing music? He wasn't, but he was, a definitely a main influence it was his record collection by and far was my main like drove my musical taste for a good decade if not forever you know what was um, he, he is your brother still around yeah yeah he's he's living down in centralia washington now kicking kicking him back retired drinking whiskey smoking pipes not a bad way to be. no no his wife like makes bread all the time and she loves raising goats and they have land and they both knit sweaters and it's pretty ideal that doesn't sound terrible man. <laughs> <laughs> no and he plays guitar so we'll we'll talk to each other about guitars and we'll talk to each other about music um, did he start playing when you started playing guitar no he started playing like maybe five i want to say five ten years ago he and his wife started just spontaneously picking up the guitar and learning chords and i love it when adults pick up guitar. it's cool it's great it's a it's a it's first of all it's just fun right so like everybody needs to have fun the toys are cool you know and it's it, like it does something to you it's like therapy you know it's a it makes your brain work differently for sure for that, for that little while and then when you're done you feel better you know it's yeah so so it's it was fun to see them they kind of tailed off you know they get to the point where they're they, things get a little too challenging or something and they don't have a teacher so they haven't been playing as much but right but they're cool so what was the first thing that you you moved on to from the tupperware drum <laughs> after the tupperware drums my good best friend Tom Ewers that I grew up with um he was living in a neighborhood at that point in Lakewood Tacoma Washington and somebody of his had like a partial drum set that he was selling for 10 bucks or something like that so Tom dime bag yep he he put out the 10 bucks and bought me it was a snare drum a rack tom and a, and a kick drum and so I had to find a pedal and like I found an old floor tom, you know, like an old trading 
musician kind of store and mm-hmm. you know put and find and then my brother when i was living with him out in belfair for christmas got me some jc penny symbols and <laughs> symbol stands yeah and they were the they sounded terrible like you didn't want to hit them like it was time to hit the crash and you just ah, just, (laughs) and i think they were stamped out like sheet metal and dyed a bronze color or something of course yeah so they looked like a symbol but so then yeah by the time i was 13 maybe i had kind of that shit drum set and and i was off to the races like we had a separate garage from the house it wasn't heated or anything it was just I could play drums anytime I wanted to out in Belfair, you know? So I just had headphones and like a little Walkman kind of thing. Yeah. And I would just play tapes of like the jam or, you know, like the clash or something. I just play along with records for like three hours every day for, I did that for like three years or something. So that's what your brother was into. He was into like, the jam and the clash and probably the ramones and yeah at first when we were living together as yeah yeah exactly and when we were little kids he was into zeppelin and the who and you know like i would i would listen at the you know like if i tried to listen to records when we were kids he'd kick me out because i was like a little first grader you know so you don't want a six-year-old kid hanging out with you while you're you know he was like the reason he got pissed at me in the first place for ever bothering him playing music is because I heard this, I think it was The Who, and it was just like a song, you know, like, you know, just like Bob O'Reilly or something I heard a million times. And I'm just like, oh, I love this song. And I ran into his room to tell him, and he was jamming on a tennis racket. <laughs> <laughs> and he just got really embarrassed and I just started smacking me with the tennis racket. Get the fuck out of here. So then I always had to listen through the heater vent if he was playing records and stuff. But yeah, he was into like classic shit, you know all when he was a he was probably in high school junior high at that time but then when he got into the the navy went to the east coast and it was like 77 so he learned all about punk rock and and so he came back with just like literally like two big crates full of records and maybe a full third of them haven't even been cracked yet so we were like we opened all mod cons like the you know we like like busted through the the shrink wrap and fucking heady times man (laughs) that's great yeah that was a fantastic education musical education i think and so and this is what and this is what you learned how to play music to Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i really started playing drums right about when i hit the punk kind of punk rock phase kind of kind of getting into more like my brother was he was very eclectic so he ended up with like link ray records and clash records and then it would be joe jackson and then it would be roxy music and bowie and sex pistol i mean it was it was fucking heaven you know like like i didn't know for a long time that those were all different musical genres you know that you you're not supposed to play right. roxy music and then play never mind the bollocks you know or but well what are you supposed to play after roxy music i mean there's <laughs> i know and, and those are such good records like those you know like uh manifesto oh. and country life like those records i i those were like my you know growing up records you know like i started listening to van halen and, and scorpions and you know it's very much listening to KISW and, right. you know, and listening to ACDC and, you know, I loved hard rock Aerosmith and stuff. So what then, year is it, this we're talking uh, when you sort of semi inherit this record collection, is it in, in real time of its release? Mm-hmm. Like it's 78, 79. Right. So my brother had, probably i think he was stationed in michigan somewhere in michigan not detroit wherever probably you know on the lake somewhere probably if he's in the navy and they put you in fucking michigan (laughs) so he's he's somewhere and he has access to an awesome record store and every you know he's living on the base he's not spending money to eat or anything so he spends all his money on records and 
can't even listen to him fast enough. So yeah, we, we, you know, we were cracking all mod cons in 79. And I think that's the year I think came out in 78, maybe. I don't know. This is fucking awful. I just, I had to check my, I have a structure fire. So if this was a, what? if it was a traffic accident, if it was a, something like that, I would not probably respond, but a, a structure fire is something I have to respond to. Oh, wait, are you're doing, are you fireman? I'm a volunteer firefighter. So it's fucking awesome. I'm, I'm really sorry, but I have to cut us short. Um, that makes sense. That's and, awesome. uh, I don't know how long I'll be gone, but um, do you want to try for later today? I'll call you and see. I, I have something scheduled later on, but I'll call you in a while and I, hopefully we can pick right back up. I'm so okay. sorry. No, no problem. No, no, uh, no, no, but no. I, I have to blast right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Just give me a call or text me. And we'll try to finish this later. We'll just whatever you go ahead and do what you need to do. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. Good luck. Don't unmute oh there we go can you hear me i can i can Shit. Hear very well yes I, I like when technology works yeah no it's <laughs> great it's a, every single time it surprises me when it work when it works in my favor mm -hmm. how are you doing i'm doing good um i just has been like go 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 today grocery one of those grocery shopping trips where you have to get you're trying to get everything for two weeks or something, you know. You guys expecting more snow? No, it's the it's the kind of the COVID sort of the pact right. kind or people sort of make with the grocery store. But shit, I'm there like every couple of days because I forget something anyway. So do they have a delivery grocery delivery service <laughs> on the island? They probably yeah, I think they do. But it's not you know i don't know i it, it's too expensive anyway because it's groceries on the island it's right. like because you're on the island you have to pay so much more so i'll go get the goddamn groceries <laughs> right i refuse to order groceries off amazon i don't like to buy anything on amazon if i can help it me too me too um, um yeah we i got well, actually, I have to admit that I bought some stuff for Christmas this year. But yeah, usually that's kind of my last resort. Right. First is we'll buy it on the island because we want to support the island. So we'll pay stupid prices to buy like a pair of jeans on the island, but we'll do it. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then some things you can't get off the island. So we're like, well, we can get that in West Seattle. And then we like, and then eventually it's like, shit, we got to order it online. Right. You know, the one reason, of course, is because they are, you know, they're the monster now, right? Mm -hmm. But also, they have the worst looking website <laughs> I've ever seen. And I fucking hate visiting it. It's so fucking ugly. It's so not enjoyable to, to look at or interact with. It's not the most informative. It's just not friendly. Mm -mm. It's it's a piece of shit, but it probably rakes in the dough. So they don't need, you know, like, well, you know, the whole Amazon story. Any really, anyway, really they're the way they make their money is from web services, Amazon web services, AWS. They sell all the technology, the fucking everyone, probably eBay, any any online store that's worth it salt is probably there's aws software in the background and so they don't really have like their their retail thing is kind of like it's you know it's like well you know it's like sears now you know <laughs> it's like they don't gotta sweep it or anything people will go in there and buy with it you know it's like amazon's kind even though that's kind of a bad analogy but but i just feel like Amazon doesn't have to, they don't have to be any good because they just, you know, just spends money on something that they're not making the money off of. But the, I mean, but a hundred percent of what, what, what am I trying to say? You know, if, <laughs> even if they have a 5% margin, 
on everything mm. that they sell, which is terrible for retail, right? Like you, you wouldn't be able to stay open in a retail environment making a 5% margin. But if you have 5% of everything and everything goes out of business, then what the fuck do you care? You are the market. Yeah, it's I I I hate what Amazon has done. I hate what the internet has done. Although this kind of thing is pretty cool, like what we're doing here. For sure. You know? But the whole kind of social media news cycle, weird, you know, rabbit holes you can go down. I think the internet might be the worst invention ever. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I, I would disagree. Would you? Only because it is, I think the, the nuke is probably the worst invention. There you go. That one's pretty bad. Although the, <laughs> it's pretty the, <laughs> that, well, the, well, yeah, I guess what we're talking about are things that when they go right are kind of awesome. Like nuclear energy, when it goes right is, you know, it's like, sure renewable kind of free energy just if you fuck up those you know if you start messing with atoms and stuff Another nature <laughs> uh but the internet is just a like is this a tool and what happens with it is a reflection of where we're at as a society you know maybe that and maybe when that's shitty things sad. are going down it's because we're shitty <laughs> that could be it it could just be a big mirror, the black mirror. But really? Yeah. That show was great, except that the I didn't love the last it. season it sucked. Sucked. What the fuck are you guys doing? I think they someone maybe someone snorted a bunch of coke and all their budget went away or something. But yeah, I think I can't even remember the last season. Maybe the first one the was the first one, the Star Trek thing. Was that from the that first That was great. That, so that one was great. And then after that, it, it just went. Because I mean, you know, that that's a high standard to make that show. Because those early episodes were creepy. <laughs> For real. That was like the new Twilight Zone. Yeah. Did you watch any of the Twilight Zone that was the remake? I did not. I didn't see any of it either. I don't watch conventional television yeah we we don't either we have like one of those little digital antenna things so you can yeah. watch kind of the local news yeah if you need to or like live sports or something if right um <clears throat> but yeah we'll watch you know we'll watch some television some movies certainly way more now than we used to you know right sorry we got cut off no, that was a cool, I mean, not a cool Anyone reason. that's like listening, we are now speaking two days later. It's, uh, that was Saturday and it, now it is Monday evening. Mm -hmm. um, I got a fire call. It was a real actual fire and uh, yeah. It was yeah, it was, you said it was a structural fire, was it? It was Were a they... house, someone's house. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Were there so injuries? What is, I don't know how it started, but what I do know is that this whole area lost power that afternoon. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it when the power came back on, you know? Right. But it could have. Yeah, that or maybe somebody, since it, there was no power, was trying to... Was there gas in the house? Like... Gas I don't I didn't go inside. I was running, you know, we, we live out here. We got, we're kind of like you guys, you guys don't have fire hydrants on the Island. So if there's a fire, you know, tankers show up, but that water gets used up pretty quickly. So yeah. there are water sources around all areas. And uh, what happens is there's like a, like this was a mutual aid call. So tons of, districts tons of towns replied to this call um the county 911 dispatched everyone basically mm -hmm. so we showed up boom we threw we throw down this thing it's like a portable it's called a portable pond it looks like a 
an above ground pool and it's like has a collapsible metal frame you throw it down and then people just relay in a you know however you try to set up strategically so that trucks can come along there's tanker trucks from all around they fill up they dump and almost as fast as you can dump the water in there you know it's gone thousands of gallons yeah it's it gets sucked out pumped out by another truck and pushed with you know attack lines yeah yeah How it's they... pretty crazy like it's some it's some uh pretty interesting engineering yeah yeah they have pumps like a series of pumps to get the water pressure so you can pump that amount of water they're and... pumper trucks yeah yeah <clears throat> so our truck was parked you know it's depending on because you know you never your fires don't start in controlled environments you know it's like they're not consistent so sometimes you get in there all quick and you know you get set up and in, in an awkward way this time we were pretty lucky so but the uh some they lost a cat which was really terrible oh, they lost it was the awful cat. man it was really awful the two of them got out two cats got out but they they lost the cat which was it's awful yeah that's hard on top of everything else you know no yeah. but well it was fucking 20 degrees out i got my hands <laughs> wet like right away because i'm on the pond you know like, uh, it, was just pond, freezing. it was terrible dude <laughs> you know <laughs> You're like, why am I doing and there's a lot of motherfuckers out there and I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm like, because it's the right thing to do. Jesus. It's the right thing to do. Remember you talked about you how you hate being cold too. So Oh dude, like- I hate it. I hate it. I also hate being hot. Mm-hmm. Like okay. uh, you know, you're a northwest guy. You probably don't like it above 85, right? Fuck 85, man. I like 70 degrees. That's, That's what I, you know. Yeah, because I, I spent a long time. I spent my youth probably thinking, you know, like it was always cool the hottest it ever got. Because you're in Seattle, you know, it's just kind of a rarity. It gets in the 90s or something. So you celebrate it and you're a kid and you go swimming or whatever. But as an adult, yeah, like I do not like it when it's hot. I do not like it when it's cold. 70, like we keep our house at 68 degrees. Yeah, buddy. 70 degree outside with a breeze is kind of like perfect you know other than that like uh, like arizona kind of heat or where you're at in in the winters is the hudson valley colder than up upstate like further up north no no it gets it definitely gets colder up there Mm -hmm. but you know just depends you know, it was fucking negative 13 degrees here with the wind chill factory. And I'm out there walking the dogs. My dogs are like, they get outside and they look at me and they'll just like, we'll go to the bottom of the steps and they'll crap them. Just be like, all right, let's go. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, it's pretty you just funny. just shit a brick. And I so just break. Like, they'll let me know. Like, I, I am not into this. You asshole. Let's get back in the house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay I'm trying to remember where I mean we got cut off and you you were telling me that you I think you were you were still uh you were you were a teenager and you're with your brother Mm -hmm. yeah yep yep those days um good uh, days those are a good good day I think we were talking about how I kind of saw that time of my life as a it was like not a technically good part of my life you know because you know going back to our dysfunctional family histories and stuff um there's a lot of stuff that you know like um child protective services wouldn't fly (laughs) but um but when i look back at it now as an adult i'm like i'm kind of grateful in a way of you know like total freedom tons of great records to listen to my a drum set to play you know like you know friends to try and find drugs with right you know, all the things you need 
<laughs> as, a, as a delinquent teenager. Yeah. I had a motorcycle, so I could go get drugs. You did. You had a motorcycle. Yeah. I had like an XR 75 or something like that. It was like a Honda. It's like a Honda kind of a trail trail bike for little kids, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Did you ever do psychedelic drugs and ride a motorcycle? Yes. How yes. was that? Twice. Twice. I wouldn't recommend it because it was so I one time I did it it was on shrooms and it was just an accident like we went to this place where we always pick and we ate them and then we're like, "Oh, we got to go home." And so it was a little scary. The second time I did it, I almost couldn't resist the urge to let go and fly <laughs> and i'm like that's not i you know the other part of your brain is like that's not a good urge that's i've been in cars and i've driven a car on mushrooms which is a, also a bad idea it was really fun and i was you know everyone thinks they're really good at it it, it just just seems like a video game like then it was night also of course um, but late at night and we lived in the country, so it wasn't, you know, you didn't encounter other cars really, you know, but being on a motorcycle would be a completely immersive physical experience because of the air surrounding you and the air and the vibrations and oh the, my good and Lord. just, yeah. And then I one time I was on a road bike because this I had the little the little mini bike thing for ages. Then another brother of mine, Randy, who went into the Air Force, left a Honda Hawk 400. And so I just like, that's mine now. So, so both of your brothers joined the military. Yeah. Yeah. They were right out of high school. They were they just wanted to leave. Was he career also? <laughs> no, he. He stayed in the Air Force for like, I think, six years. He re-enlisted, but then sort of said, I don't like this and got a honorable discharge, an early discharge or something like that. Yeah. Um, your other brother was career, you said, yeah? He was kind of career. He went in for um, eight years and then he retired hmm. and ended up going to work for Boeing. Oh, okay. So, um, but yeah, yeah, those, those guys just, I think, you know, wanted to split. Yeah, and my thing was not the military, most, <laughs> and it you wasn't even that. a cultural thing, you know, because like uh -huh. our, you know, since my brothers were in and 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 my dad had been in, like it wouldn't have been a stretch for me to have joined or anything. But I just, I just, I was such a narcissist. <laughs> it's like, how much fun can I have? And you know, like a total hedonistic kind of, you know, like. Like what can You'd I be do? Surprise, for buddy! <laughs> I know. I joined, the, I joined the Marine Corps, and there was some gnarly shit that went on. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. I think anywhere where there's a bunch of twenty-year-old kids, there's yeah. shit that's going to happen. Yeah, there's shit that's going to go down. <laughs> that's good. That's kind of. I think that's what your brain is telling you to do at that time of your life. Sure. It's like you know, be, be something, make a mark, do this, you know, like have fun, push the limits. Yeah. Oh, uh, so are you, are you experimenting with recording and stuff during this time? Mm, in the seventies, uh, eighties. Well, like well, you were, you know, living in this house with your brother and no i had no, no four track anything like that no concept of that the guy who introduced that kind of stuff to me is my friend tom ewers who was in chemistry set a long time ago oh. and he was he was the guy who got me into like getting two boom boxes and double tracking you know, like doubling yeah. vocals you know it's like that sounds like the beatles right <laughs> And we do stuff like that, but but actual like actual getting to know equipment enough to record and and stuff that didn't that bug didn't hit me till maybe two thousand or something. Even when I was recording albums with bands back in the nineties, for some reason that just was not on my radar to learn about 
what mics did what and i just depended on people i knew who did that shit right um, and then just kind of became a ne- necessity in the 2000s because i wanted to make a lot more music but i didn't want to pay for studios so i just learned the shit right bought it made terrible recordings until i made half decent recordings right. <laughs> you know after eight years <laughs> are you listening to johnny sangster's podcast i am actually i'm enjoying it yeah, yeah yeah that one with kurt was good and the one with rachel was really great she's awesome yeah yeah she works at well it used to be rfi now it is resonant audio mastering place yeah her and ed brooks are great both of them are awesome great people to work with and and also just talented talented you know ed mastered both of the nevada bachelors albums could be did johnny record those johnny recorded the first one yeah then that would have gone to ed for sure yeah yeah D- uh, at egg yeah yeah what a treat it was to to get to go there it's such a modest place but you probably spent some time there i spent yeah. a lot of time there yeah i made three four maybe four almost five albums there probably oh that's great did you Um, record who did you record with mostly with kurt block yeah almost all the time with kurt i'm trying to think of a time where we didn't it was it was essentially kurt got us in there i mean i knew conrad uno and pop llama and stuff um and we'd recorded a record over at triangle which was think maybe hands audio at the time which is that the where's that now it's the hall of justice yeah 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 was it reciprocal before that it might have just turned into reciprocal when we went and recorded this pure joy album called carnivore but pop llama ended up putting that record out and then from then on i kind of started going to to egg yeah it's cool yeah cool place good vibe so, yeah. you know, like no frills no even the grocery stores no frills it's a fucking albertson's <laughs> it's like the, like you can't make me go over there yeah <laughs> but yeah that place was great and that's you know i look back on those days and it, i just kicked myself because i was not interested in gear right i was that i would have paid attention to yeah I, I i look back at some photos you know like some Buddy, you know jim or somebody took photos and i'm looking looking at mics and i'm like oh man i, I was singing through an akg 414 you know like, You're like, <laughs> like back then here. <laughs> yeah back then i didn't yeah it's like what's this piece of metal in front of me or you know but, what yeah, was I, the what was the time the connective time between being at your brother's house and and playing shows in seattle and what um, was there overlap there yeah it was kind of like the common thread again i my friend tom that i grew up with he and i were you know like buds and always listening to you know like turning each other on to new music and and you know like we were the kind of people who you'd be on the we'd be on we'd call each other and we'd play each other records over the phone you know it's like check out this new jam record or check out you know like whatever you know echo and the bunnyman or julian cope or something you know and and so he and i even when i was out on the peninsula out on hood canal and belfair he still we still kept in touch and then he lived in lakewood still in tacoma i eventually moved back to the like the sumner puyallup area and then so we were close enough then where we were like every weekend we'd get together and he played his sears Les Paul copy, you know, then yeah. I played my drum set with JC Penny cymbals. And we did that for maybe a couple of years, like every weekend. And then eventually started figuring out how to like learn a song, you know, like learn covers. Yeah. And so we looked the first yeah. cover, the first set of covers that you guys were doing. Yeah, so we were doing stuff like we were really into like post punk, like the fall and 
like I said, Echo and the Bunny Men. What other stuff were we doing? Um, there's that band magazine. Yeah. That um that kind of came out of the Buzzcocks. Um Psychedelic like Furs shit. Psychedelic yeah. Furs, yeah, all that like the, those first two records from those guys. Yeah. Um the church, you know, like mm. you know, so we were really into that kind of stuff, which was fortunate because that kind of music is not very virtuosic. It's just playing chords and jangle rock and but interesting and, textures and stuff yeah 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 but you you didn't need to know you know you just needed to know like oh i want reverb on my guitar you know that's all you had to know you didn't have to know how to play it <laughs> so so that in that respect we we're i think we we're lucky because i didn't discourage me like if i would have if I would have really started playing guitar and I was still into Van Halen and or Van Halen and, and like um, Racer X or bands like that, I would have just given up, right. you know, because uh, I would have just been like, I, you know, I'm going to learn golf now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but since, since I mostly was influenced by punk and kind of new wave and you know now you look back on it and it's like oh yeah it's just sort of that it's kind of like how the Beatles were people just starting to learn instruments and how to use them and that just makes the most magical music you know and, yeah it's great and so when does when does pure joy become a, a thing when when does that start that starts in 86, 85, 86. And so, so how old are you at this point? I would, I would be 19 and 20. Yeah. And before that, we were the Dwindles, um, <laughs> which I still want, I kind of want to take that name back and it's use it for my next band. It. We used it for a while. We played, we were kind of lucky. Um, again, my friend Tom had gone to Evergreen State College and he's a friendly guy. So he got to know a bunch of guys and our network expanded from Tacoma to Tacoma and Olympia. And I just, we, a friend of mine, Lisa King, she was a friend of all of our girlfriends that went to this high school called Bellarmine in Tacoma. It was like a private school. Uh -huh. And so Lisa pay, played bass and she loved the who and she loved Neil Young. And we're like, fuck yeah. So instant bass player. I played drums. Tom played guitar. Eventually my friend Scott Sutherland, you know him probably a little bit. He's in the model rockets. Sure. Um, but he played, I he and I got to know each other in Tacoma. I actually answered his um ad in the rocket. <laughs> That's how I met him. <laughs> and nice. um and he's been a friend since then. He's been a friend like 40 years or something have you been but, following do, are you you're on instagram yeah no, no no there's a there's an instagram account that is uh it's all photographs and excerpts from 90s issues of the rocket <laughs> and it's great man there's that would like be fun. distant club listings there's some stuff from the 80s even um you know there's a i wonder if they're there because there is a a thing i'm following on facebook that is doing kind of the same thing it but it's, the same thing. it might be it's probably just a everyone starting to do the same thing like scanning old shit and it's great yeah yeah because i'm I'll were, see, like i'll see like oh i remember that i was at that show where i was yeah. i saw fucking five of those shows that week or yep. look there's one of my shows i remember that show yeah, that's that's great. Actually, I should I should join Instagram just to check that out, just because it's pretty fun. Memory lane, <laughs> and yeah. plus a lot of those things you don't recall until you get reminded of them. You know, whether you need to, yeah, you know, because it all blends together. So if you don't need to parse through that shit, you your brain doesn't do it. You know, exactly. and then you look at something like that, and you're like, fuck. I drank whiskey with that guy that night, you know, <laughs> 28 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So 
so you are you're still living you're in in not spanaway you're in uh sumner in sumner yeah so sumner finishing up high school last year of high school well actually shit man last couple of years of high school i was still playing drums in our band all the same people we were called second story and I was singing and playing drums <laughs> singing and drumming because and drumming, nobody else would sing. And like, I didn't think I could sing at the time. You know, I just would, you know, I'm like, well, we need to keep track of where we are in the song. So somebody sing along and right. they stuck a mic in front of me. Um, and then that was second story. And then also Sue Ewers, who is Tom's older sister, she's kind of a thread too because she went on to play with mazzy star and opal and stuff she's wow. the, she was the keyboard player for those bands and she was you know i grew up with her and tom and so you know that was our band and we would play down in olympia at the tropicana and play we you know anywhere we could we you know right we had a mini storage one of those sure guard mini storages That's was out on the highway and so so we went and we talked to we were like we went to the front desk we were i was still a junior in high school and we were like hey we you know we want to look at a at a at a at a storage unit but we want to use it for band practice and we thought for sure like you know they're going to shut us down and old lady's like band practice and she's like let's go take a look and opened one of the units and there sure enough there's like an outlet in it and we're like that's all we need <laughs> We just need like, one plug. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did it with one plug. <laughs> Sang out of a guitar amp, you know, right. totally fucking ghetto. And um, and she let us do it. And so we had a weekly practice space when we were in high school. It was the wow. Shergard Mini Studio. And it was exactly, it was in Parkland. So it was literally halfway point of Sumner where I lived in Lakewood and Stillicum where Scott and Sue and Tom did you guys places. leave your gear there or did you guys yeah there's look? a storage unit that's sketchy man well yeah it's sketchy but we we wouldn't have even thought about that our gear was sketchy like we had the shittest <laughs> like if someone would have ripped off my gear i would have been you know like i could have gone to my mom and maybe asked for a new drum set or something but right but so we were not worried about that and plus we figured, yeah, this is a storage area. It's like, it's secure. It had a gate, right. you know? So, so we thought that was cool and had a rude awakening when we all moved to Seattle and like, you know, real estate was precious. If you could only afford $200 a month to rent some place. <laughs> so what, what year did you move to Seattle and did you guys move to Seattle as a band? Kind of. Yeah. Every, like, like um like my friend tom had gone to to evergreen for a year but he decided to go to u-dub and then that was the year that scott graduated high school and a couple other friends and everyone started going to the u-dub so it was just kind of like well let's just move this action from lakewood sumner to seattle sue had already had a place she was she was four or five years older than tom and i so she was already going to UW and had a place out in Greenwood. And so we would crash there and just kind of eventually, you know, we would Greenwood stay. Back then was the woods. <laughs> we got lost one time. We got on Aurora going home and we'd never seen, we'd never seen Aurora. We're like, what the hell is this? And we couldn't figure out how to get off. And we were going by the kingdom at the time. And right. You know, and it was probably one of those days after we tripped, you know, so we were just like, you know, we didn't um, sleep the night before. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's fucking great. Yeah. So that eventually we kind of, that's how we got into Seattle. Uh, and then I got a job at Burger King. <laughs> really? Yeah. In As, Seattle? Where, where is that? Yeah, uh, there's one on the Ave. It's gone now. There's another one I think that might might still be there like on 47th in the Ave or 50th in the Ave. But I, the one I worked on was like down, down like 42nd. Right. And it was just a, it was terrible. Kind of a, it was terrible. totally terrible. Yeah. It was like, um, you know, there, cause there were a lot of college people, a lot of frat dudes. 
which were that was the worst like those guys were the worst <laughs> and then just above them were the mentally ill people that lived up in like greek row because they had like some um community housing and those people were were crazy like literally crazy. yeah <laughs> i still preferred them to the frat dudes so right and then there and then there was just you know whatever you know you could you could reason with a mentally ill person i could yeah i couldn't reason with a frat dude <laughs> i knew which side my bread was buttered on <laughs> right. right crazy guy that's the guy i'm following home <laughs> so so you have this gig and you guys are you guys are all living in the same house like it's a big like a kind of you know like kind of i got um we sort of split up into a couple bands like scott and i were both songwriter i switched to guitar eventually that's kind of when the dwindles happen is i switch from drums to guitar um and then scott and i were kind of you know like we didn't know what to do with two people who wrote songs and wanted to sing and probably had outsized egos Right. And so we split up and he had his band chemistry set and I had, that's when the dwindles became pure joy. And so that was like 85, 86, but yeah, we were all living up in Seattle. Lisa was going to school, our bass player. She lived over in Wallingford, me and Jim Honeycutt, our drummer got oh, a place. I know, I know Jim. You know Jim? Is he yeah, still around? He, yeah. He plays in Llama, the band that I play in. And he has PLFC, Paul Lynn Fan Club. He it's might remember band. me. We both worked in the Pike Place Market. That was one of my probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know? Do you remember Don Smithson from that era? No, Holy it was hair. this was the nineties. Yeah, yeah, ninety four. And Jim, I think Jim, I don't know what he was doing down there. He was working at the Creamery. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. God, there yeah. was such a fucking crew of people that worked there. Liz yeah, yeah. from Center Bitch. Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't know them all back then. I so yeah, many like many people worked in the market. Um yeah, it, it was it was a great place to be. Yeah, Jim was pretty enamored by it. He was there for years. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. Crazy. Me, hello, please. He, I think he would remember me. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell him. I'm sure he would. Uh, he I still has his. He still has his mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so you guys, so this is how pure joy happens. Boom. Yeah. So then we needed, like Scott left, so we became a three piece, and for I don't know, maybe a half a year, then my brother joined playing keyboards. He came out of the Air Force didn't know what the fuck he was going to do he came to live with me in seattle and started messing around on synthesizer so we joined forces so um so pure joy started, started so he didn't playing. reply to an ad that said hair and attitude a must <laughs> no 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 <laughs> at that point we were generally we were kind of like we knew we weren't going to be you know we weren't we we're we we're trying to be like new order or something or joy division or you know like right. we didn't know we kind of knew we couldn't play like i'd only been playing guitar for a couple of years at this point now i switched to drums to guitar and it's 80 yeah no this is 80 this is 85 six sort of what's the vibe in 85 in 86 in seattle because we bear what's that there was there was not what places where we were going. We'd go to, there was a place called the Metropolis. Right. And we would go there because it was all ages, but still it was Seattle. So it was like too far away. Our parents really wouldn't let us drive there. So we would, we would say, we're going to a midnight movie at, in, you know, at the SeaTac mall and parents would give us a car and then we'd fucking drive as fast as we could, like 90 miles an hour, <laughs> get up to Seattle and then we'd go to Metropolis shows and see the U Men or see like that's when we first started seeing Room Nine and um, uh, like Red Mask. 
fastbacks and the fellows have always been around right there yeah fastbacks have, i saw at a place around called Seattle was established as a <laughs> as a municipality yep yeah they were the pioneers they came in on stagecoach right fastbacks they built the they built uh pioneer square on top of the <laughs> fire <of> the mains <laughs> yeah it was a long time ago and, but yeah, I was, so I like there were cool scenes like that going on, but we were not invited to play at the Metropolis. We were um, we were just barely, you know, we were very green. We played a couple shows at this place called the Royal Crown, which was a Chinese restaurant on Fourth Avenue where the Westlake Center is. Oh wow! So it used to be a piano room, and then a second story was this. Chinese restaurant and they had shows and so we would play there and and play with like bands like the color twigs you know and sort of these weird kind of weird psychedelic bands anyone um, anyone from those bands go on to to do other stuff that I would remember from the 90s because I didn't show up till the 90s 90s yeah I I I kind of feel like and now I can't, I'm blanking on the name of the band, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some of those, some of those people, you know, like we didn't know anybody then. So I right. was a stranger. The only person I remember from that time was Susan Silver. And right. She would come out to see shows and she, I remember her coming up to us and like being very complimentary and we were just so happy, you know, like we were, you know, like from, you know, well, what, Kent and Sumner and <laughs> what was she doing at this point? In I think at the time she was there was dating... no Soundgarden, right? No, no, this was before Soundgarden. So she was, I think, maybe dating the guy from this one band, and I'm blanking on their name again because we played two shows with them, and you know, five thousand years ago. But I think she may have been dating the lead singer, songwriter guy from that band. Um, mm -hmm. And so she was there. I'd seen her a couple of times at a couple of shows. And, um, but nobody else I remember from that time, you know. Um, some of the, the the Olympia guys, for sure, though, like Scott Vanderpool, yeah. who went on to KISW fame as wow. Rock Jock Supreme. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like Chris Pugh from um, Swallow. Right. Bradley Sweek. Um you know, all those guys, kind of the Olympia, the Olympia crew, we knew better than the Seattle crew. <clears throat> and the vibe in Seattle is extremely different at this point than now, of course. But even then in from 85 to 90 to 93 was like the afterburner rocket that sent it over the top. Yeah, that period was totally crazy. Um, what, like, the way I see it is like clubs like the Metropolis and um, like C Craven Image. What was the other one? There was that one that was like a, it was an old movie theater, Gorilla Gardens, right. from like the late 80s or maybe just late 80s, I think. Um, but it was an old movie, like a multiplex. And so it had two rooms, two theaters, and there would be the metal room and the punk room. And so we would see shows or we play shows like with room nine or the walkabouts in the, in the punk room, but between bands, I'd go check out the metal bands. And it was just, it was a trip. It was like two worlds, man. It was like, what kind like of metal bands were playing that was it like hair metal, hair metal, hair, hair, metal, hair metal. metal. Yeah. Hair metal. Um, you know, super fast, you know, tapping solos and shit. And what I liked best about it though, is I, more than once I saw bands fight on stage when I went to the metal room and that was fun. Really? Yeah. Like inner band fighting, fist fighting. Yeah. Well, throwing stuff at each other, you know, throwing guitar. So that um, was like a, a, a drum. <laughs> yeah. It was just, it was just like, you know, like, like a guitar player, like, and the, the guy trying to play double bass drum, but he's, you know, probably doesn't really know how to play it and he's right. not keeping up and, you know, didn't sound good. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a fight on stage. 
I've seen a few. I've seen um, The Liars. Do you know that band? Yes. Yeah, kind of garage I don't yeah, like I remember. the deepest fights. Yeah, was that when the drummer threw his drum stool at the singer <laughs> and like hit him right in the face, like busted oh. him open. And so the rest of the set, they, they played. <laughs> yeah, this is at the Central, Central Tavern. Wow. Yeah, it's, I saw Mark Arm fight the drummer, no, not fight, the drummer from three o'clock kind of got into it one night. <laughs> I don't like, I don't like violence. Me neither, me neither. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, the, that, that reminds me, you gotta, you gotta um, talk to me about the Duff story. Speaking <laughs> <laughs> of violence? Was it all? Is it an old story? It's not that old, and it's not really violent at all. No, like he, he threatened violence, but nothing ever materialized. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how how long were you playing shows? And going right now, right now, everyone's going. I do I want to hear about this guy playing shows or with that Duff story? Fuck, man. (laughs) I don't want to care about this guy's shit. It's like clickbait, but uh, (laughs) but it involves a lot more patience. It's like the opposite of clickbait. That's right. You have to listen to the whole goddamn thing. Um, no, what was what were you saying? How till I started what? Well, you know, you've stated a couple times that you didn't really know how to play, but then you're playing shows and you're practicing and like how long before you felt like, oh, I mean, I got this. I've developed my own thing. I've developed a style and I feel confident in that. 2005 is when that <laughs> <happened>. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> That's when the epiphany came. Like that's okay. when how I when I felt like I know how to play this instrument and I know how to sing with my instrument that singing like all of the stuff before was luck. And um, since I wrote everything, it would be like it would be like if you were uh, the most literate person in the world and you could write the most beautiful prose and then you only spoke what you wrote like everyone would be like this person is a great speaker (laughs) (laughs) so if i only played what i wrote i'm fine you know like um so when i started playing guitar it was like it wasn't very far in where we were playing big shows and stuff and i didn't really know how to play guitar or anything and but if as long as I just kept playing the things that were our songs, then we liked it and some people kind of liked it. Right. Um, but I, God, I didn't know what I was doing, man. I, I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it was 2000, 2005 when I, I, that's when it was like, that's when I formed that band Llama. <clears throat> and, and that kind of came together like I always hoped a band would. So how did you how did you balance it? In how did I navigate for twenty three years before that? Like how just beer or whiskey shots? <laughs> I wasn't even into that into alcohol that much. I mean, you could blame pot, maybe. I think it was a lot of, you know. I mean, think about your first bands and stuff. And it was more like a gang than a. Right. band like, like it was more important that you liked like your bass player than you thought he was a brad bass player you know like because you weren't ra- you know like i wasn't a rad guitar player so i didn't you know if anybody else wasn't rad <laughs> right. and they wanted to go on this trip with me it's like oh, come on you know like you're more than welcome and so that's how that's how flop happened you know a bunch of friends hanging out we're all poor. We, when it snowed, we would rather go like snowball cars on the Ave. 
than practice right. our instruments. <laughs> um, but if we had nothing better to do, we would practice our instruments and play. And I was really into writing it was, songs. It, it was well. I was just gonna say there was a lot of progress uh, toward, uh, like your sort of, like your songwriting style. In that time, it seems like there was a lot of growth. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't, that was the motivation for me is like writing tunes, uh, it's fun to play stuff you wrote. Um, and it was cool, whatever buddy else added to it, you know, I don't, on occasion, I'm like, you know, let's do this in halftime and not regular, you know, like that kind of direction, but otherwise, you know, like, Jim Honeycutt, who was the Pure Joy drummer, Llama drummer, um, and Nate Johnson, who drummed in flop. Like, those guys are amazing. Like, I try not to tell them. And, and you know, like, you kind of show them the song and stuff like that, but just let them do their thing. Right. And same with Lisa King on bass and Scott Sutherland, who is it? awesome way better guitar player and singer than i am but he's the bass player and harmony singer in llama and he just kicks ass he's the secret weapon you know you don't you don't operate like prince (laughs) and (laughs) you're not like prince where you're like uh giving people uh dance move notes like you need to be doing this and that you need dancing over there too No, you know, but I could see if, you know, like, I can see that because if you're Prince, your standards are high. Like, like, if someone's going to play guitar along with you, they better fucking be a good guitar player. Right. Um, Singers, players, you know, like, so if you're Prince, and you're as good as you are at recording, playing all the instruments, singing, mixing, mastering, playing solos at rip if you're that then yeah tell me how to do my thing Uh because i want to be like you (laughs) but if you're rusty willoughby then you're like sweet you hit the snare drum almost every time on that song (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome let's drink some beer (laughs) Uh who put out flops records did sub pop Mm-mm. They, i don't think they did they put out maybe a single of the month or something that but um frontier records from oh, california yeah. from la put out our first and our third record and our second record was sony sony 550 which was kind of epic records trying to epic records forming a branch that they wanted to be kind of like cool independent so right. what do they call it Sony. <laughs> who uh, who else was on the label? <laughs> um, some bands that I ought to know. Um, there was a band that we would play with often on the East Coast. Oh, God. Band <laughs> names. <laughs> yeah, but th- we would play with them. I can't think of anybody else on Sony 550. I mean, at the time, Pearl Jam was on Epic. Right. Screaming Trees. So since they had, because it was bands like that, that our A&R guy, Stuart Meyer, who works at, he's probably still at Sub Pop. He's been there forever, but he was working at Sony 550 Epic and they were Epic. I think he was working for Epic when he got interested in us. Um, And by the time we actually signed papers and all that stuff, it was Sony 550. Did, uh, Did you guys tour a bunch on that record? Yeah, we toured. We toured a lot on our first two records, like a lot, like a good, we did almost a solid year in that period of touring with only a couple small breaks. Right. Um, But we would do, yeah, we were touring a lot. We were touring the States all the time. Um, Frontier was great. Um, The only thing that they are not great about is they wouldn't listen to us about, like we would... Kurt Block is punk rock fanatic as we were. So we loved making these tight records where 
like there was no space between <laughs> songs right it would just be like you know this slam you upside the head song and then boom right into the next one and she was probably trying to look out for us but she would end up putting space between songs it just kind of like don't do that she did that on both the records that we put out um but other than fucking up the sequencing which is only one small part of making records everything else she was awesome she just they were great frontier is a great record company i think she still operates on the internet you know she was doing stuff like did you ever listen to that band thin white rope out of davis california no super prolific band put out tons of records they were on frontier such a great band super cool dual guitar kind of like television sort of band um <clears throat> they did i mean they did some pretty i'm trying to think of what they're kind of i want to say bad brains or something like that but some seminal punk stuff I came out of frontier a lot of, uh did they have the circle jerks maybe it was maybe it was that i'm sure i could get on the internet and find out exactly who yeah, but I'm just, yeah it was basically that period of la where yeah cool punk bands and 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 lisa Fr lisa fancher super smart super funny great great lady would let us crash at her house in like where was that it's kind of like around uh, kind of around universal city you know that area la oh. kind of in the hills and stuff a little bit out of hollywood um, but she'd let us crash at her house, stay there for days. She'd feed us, you know, let us come to the office and hang out in air conditioning and just bother <laughs> her while she's trying to work, you know? <laughs> uh, 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 do you remember, was your first trip touring across the United States uh, in a van, your first trip across the United States in a vehicle? um no no i was lucky enough to have had one previous cross-country car trip we lived in indiana and drove out to washington and i was three so i remember that really <clears throat> yeah i totally remember. I remember going to yellowstone i remember seeing moose a moose wow um i remember we had to stay our house wasn't quite finished so we had to stay at a holiday inn in yakima and it was you know like sunny and 85 degrees so i thought where you know it's like this is where we're living you know like this is great swimming pool and stuff so i remember that whole trip um but yeah yeah kind of as an adult um it was a pure joy tour that we went um as far as houston and back that was kind of my first experience well, actually, no, I take that back. That was the second, first tour I ever went on was down the West Coast with Pure Joy. And at the time, Craig Montgomery, who was the sound guy for Nirvana. Yeah, I know Craig. Yeah, he was our sound guy. And he eventually joined Pure Joy. He was in Pure Joy for a while. Really? Yeah, there was a, there was, there was a record we recorded and mixed. And was it kind of, the Mises also, kind of? I think he probably, I'm sure he knows Joe. So I bet you he was in the Mises for a little while. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah. Super, super kind of quiet, humble guy. Um, but yeah, he was, he, he took interest in us. He was the sound guy for like the young pioneers and room nine. He was, do you know, Carrie Montgomery at all? Yeah. So Carrie was hanging out a lot. I think dating scott vanderpool back then so we kind of tight circle craig had a pa that he'd set up for us to all practice on and then would do oh. sound for us and stuff so um, he came with us down the coast the very first tour i did um, but that was yeah just down to la and back and then we did another one a couple of years later out to houston and then flop going across all the way out to new york and all around in 1991 i want to say so doing a club tour yeah doing club tours did uh did you guys were you guys able to get on any support did you get any support gigs where you were playing theaters or anything with anyone at any point 
Yeah, we did a lot of that. We did a lot of, we did stuff with, with Screaming Trees, which is really cool. Yeah. Kind of on West Coast stuff. Then we played with the Lemonheads when they were huge. Oh, wow. We, we played for months with them. I was just following them around. That was hard because they had a bus and some of those cities were far apart and we would have to play a show and fucking get in our van and drive. Right. But, um, but we would, we, so we did shows with them. We did shows with a lot of shows with Red Cross, which is oh, really cool. Um, That's sick. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, you know, we, and then, you know, we'd open the occasional, like we opened a split end show and yeah. did stuff like that. Um, but mostly clubs. Um, the theaters were always cool. Was there anything in your touring experience, your early touring experience that, was unexpected that you learned or that you observed about other cities and the way their music communities worked? Was there anything like of note? Cause like back then pre-internet. Yeah. You can, you didn't know a lot. I think, you know, like there was Chicago, there was LA, there was New York that and like, nobody gave a fuck about Seattle and Portland. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it was just didn't. like, whatever the i mean the grunge thing happened and then everyone saw it on mtv but even then portland was like in the shadow right <laughs> they were like the little little stepbrother or whatever yep yeah yeah now portland's great like fucking yeah. like i think it's always been great yeah but. yeah it, yeah it has um it has always been great and then like the flop shows and the pure joy shows in portland were always some of the funnest we would play with um, Junior High. Well, no, we wouldn't. What was, oh, what was their band before Junior High? Heat Miser. No, did that it, was that was it? Elliot's band. We played with Heat. We played with Heat Miser. Were the so, other dudes from Heat Miser going to Junior High? Oh, Cracker yeah. Bash. What? Cracker Bash. Yeah, we played a shitload of shows with Cracker Bash. Right. They like we were kind of both just got on labels both just got some money and both got yeah. vans and so the that first tour we did um <laughs> was every other night we would headline and um it was just us and teddy and those guys and just kind of having fun sometimes you know get in trouble and sure <laughs> that's what you do when you're young sometimes <laughs> that's what you do when you're old yep um so when you were moving around and you, you know, like I said, there's now, you know, it's, it's not that weird if a New York band sounds like an LA band sounds like a Austin band, right? Because right. ever like everyone's influences are diluted by what, you know, fucking internet content or whatever. Yep. Yeah. The whole the whole newscaster um voice <laughs> yeah yeah exactly where it's just everywhere you know it's the everywhere voice it's there's no accents and stuff and, like the redneck accent yeah um it's uh so yeah there's not you know there's no regional flavor anymore but back in then, places yeah yeah in places there, there was mm -hmm. athens sure georgia Boston, definitely. Um, Chicago, definitely. Like playing at Lounge Acts, you know, you just go there and it'd be all your favorite bands. You'd just see flyers for, you know, Urge Overkill be playing there every Saturday night or something. And you're like, fuck. Okay. But um, yeah, like LA was pretty distinct, especially like, and then there'd be flavors, you know, because LA for us, it was, a lot of it was Orange County because of like the Muffs, right. bands like that who were kind of, we'd play shows with and were friendly. Um, and, you know, Oranger, um, who came out of um, San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, San Francisco, the whole, you know, the Mises uh, thing we played, that's when we met Joe and those guys. and he'd take us up to his apartment on hate and get us stoned. And, yeah. you know, then we'd go play a show or, you know, over in Oakland or something, those guys would headline or something. And, or there's bottom of the hill and we'd play 
what was it noise pop festival yeah you know, that was just so much fun those were good days they were good days uh i haven't i haven't um i didn't do any sort of eulogy poster i didn't even acknowledge uh matt's passing and uh i think it was really hard for me to digest i still haven't been able to let it it i think it hasn't fully sunk in still um I was sitting on the couch the other night by myself and it just, it like rushed over me and uh, I almost started crying. I was just like, fuck, you know, uh, there it is. Life's over, you know, like this. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Just, that's awful. I I didn't know Matt a lot we would you know the times where we'd be in the same room or something you know we'd totally say hey and hug right. or you know or say something funny and stupid he's the friendliest guy in the world exactly yeah. um i know you know i knew him from when he played with the inn out here and stuff and yeah that's yeah he that's, was out on the island probably quite a bit right? i would see him yeah you know oh. and especially if he was playing with with ian he was out he'd always come over and say hi and stuff and yeah, that's harsh. It's and then do you know Ron Heathman from the Super Suckers? Or did you know him? Uh, yeah. I I would I anytime I was in Michigan a couple times and saw him when, when he was there. And then uh I saw him a few times when I came back to visit Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, that was that's also a hard one to kind of digest. Those, it's, it's hard especially because it's like we're not we're not in our 20s and so for some reason i just don't expect i don't know i guess we all go how we're yeah go. I I, just, there's i know you know some of my old you know people i know from the flop days who are now you know have dementia you know and we're like power powerhouses in that time as people and personalities and i know them and now you know it's, it, it was cancer for one person in particular that i'm thinking of cancer and then the chemo sort of you know wrecks your brain and it, you either recover from that or you don't and if you don't then you end up with what's basically early onset dementia and having experience now around that and just a little you know you know there are people who have to live with it and that's oh, right. that's that's hard and other people i know who have you know who are terminal and it just you know that it kind of feels like go oh, it's stacking up but it's it's natural you know both of my parents passed like in the early 2000s so I kind of got used to, you know, like, oh yeah, people croaking and, you know, and then my parent or my friend's parents passing and things like that. But yeah, yeah, it's Matt, Matt was such a, he was full of life, you know? Yeah. And love. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, I, you know, when Darius passed, I definitely, this is taking a real dark fucking turn, but I just, I, I, so many things happened around that time. Like my mom was dying, Darius passed. Um, shortly after that, Joe Bass passed. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of, um, I realized that for sure I'm sad that I can't reach out to those people anymore. But more than that, I'm just really happy that I had the opportunity to know them. And I think that's the, the thing that I, I focus on. Because you have to, 
be careful what you think. Like if you just focus on negative shit, then you know, that's right. Then yep. You're gonna be you're gonna be in a negative place. You're gonna have a bunch of bullshit thoughts. Yep. If you're just like remember that amazing time that some funny ass shit happened, then that's the way you remember someone. You know? Completely agree. Yeah. yeah. You think about their you celebrate their life. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, it, it hits close to home in many ways. It's easier um, to do now that I'm older. I think when I was younger, that was a lot harder. Yeah. It's, it's a little easier process now. Also it gives me permission to, to, to do things like, like, Hey, my friend, everyone my age is dying. So I'm going to buy a new guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Because if I if I just am gonna go, then why not go? So, so what that I owe the IRS a little money and I you know <laughs> I keep telling myself like you can't take it with you and once you're gone they can't take it from you. Because yep. it ain't yours anymore. No. <laughs> um no. Let's get let's get back on course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a gavel. Great. <laughs> One interesting thing to me is, you know, whenever there have been a few times through my life where I didn't have to work, you know, mm -hmm. because music was, you know, I had a modest lifestyle and I made a little bit of scratch. And that's all I needed. Like when I moved to Seattle, you know, when I met Jim, mm -hmm. I made $40 a day. I worked four days a week and that was enough to live. Like my rent was, you know, 200 bucks. Yep. And I didn't have, you know, we split the house bills and I had a bass and a bass amp and, and a band. And that was it. Whatever. Who cares? Um, you know, it got more complex than that, but eventually I never not, didn't work. I always had a job were just cause I grew up poor and I knew, you know, yeah. I wasn't trying yeah. to find myself home or whatever. <clears throat> what were you doing when you were coming home from tour and how were, how, like, how are you, how are you living? How are you surviving? Well, by the, I mean, I was doing the same thing where I was working, I was working at Cold Mountain Juice, putting labels on, you know, bottles. I worked at Burger King. I worked, I was a Montessori teacher's assistant for years, which oh, wow. God, I'm surprised they let me work there and work around <laughs> children. So I was really, I was trying to be really good at it. And I like, well, I think I had a positive impact and I remember it fondly, but but yeah, I just always was working. And then when we went on tour, it was harder because no one would hire you. Um, so sometimes, that, you know, like at that, that time that I was touring, I just got married. Um, I would come home and I would try to get paid for doing stuff. But mostly I, I just kind of looked at me, being a musician was kind of like a uh it was like a minimum wage job, you know, and minimum wage back then was like $7 and 60 cents or 40 cents or something like that. So, you know, I would make my per diem on tour that I would shovel my pocket and try to eat as cheap as I could. And we'd make a little bit of money maybe, but, and, you know, then we started getting on labels and they gave us a little support and stuff, but um, I couldn't work and play music at the same time at that period and mostly i think because i was writing everything so when we weren't touring everyone else would go to their barista job or whatever and i had to fucking write an album right and and i would but that would take a little bit of time and um so yeah i just kind of i didn't really i didn't do much of work besides music which was great yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. 
But then that ended. <laughs> <laughs> you rejoined the work. And then I got a job. Yeah. Another job. Right. Uh, what's the fanciest? Do you, have you ever had a fancy job? Oh, I just quit my fancy job that I had for a couple decades. For a couple decades. Yeah, I was a. I worked at a, an agency where I was a art director, graphic designer guy. Thought. Yeah, I did that a lot. And that was just luck. That was like, that was 90, 1996. The whole flop fell apart. Um, I was going to turn 30 that year. And I thought 30 is too old to play rock and roll. So I'm like, I better get a job. And right. um, my friend, Pete Gerald, who at the time I knew him as a audio engineer at Hansik Audio. So he had engineered a flop record of ours and he'd started this company called Salt Mine and they did internet stuff and built websites. And he told me what to do, what to learn. And I got a job there. And then after, since 96 till just last year, I was, you know, m making pretty decent money and, benefits were you able and, to do that from home like online kind of thing or were you I would into town I would go into town I would work some days from home you know that was kind of a thing before the pandemic you know it was a uh, still you know like maybe one or two days a week I'd work from home but I would take the water taxi I live right up the hill from the ferry so I'd walk down take the taxi take it in the city before that before I was living on Vashon I just take a bus you know but worked there for ages and that was kind of another way of traveling that was sort of what kept me doing that i ended up at a company where i got to go to like london a lot and mm -hmm. chicago and new york and la and so i'd go on these trips and i'd present graphics to these companies and stuff and you know all buttoned up and then i would take an extra three days i would say i'm going to stay at this hotel for three more days and take another plane home and I just like find somebody with pot, you know, I'd go to the, you know, <laughs> go, I would go to in LA, I'd go to the mission and find some weed. And then I would just walk around LA and I'm like stone. And I had money at that time, you know, so I could get a cab and it was, it was, could have been a dangerous time, but I behaved myself for a few pretty years. Great way to see the world. It was, it was very, in London, I went to London, maybe seven or eight times over the course of a three-year period and that was awesome and it was you know it was kind of it was kind of not really seeing london i would i'd stay in um oh, what is that area K kensington which is kind of the posh area of london because yeah. we worked for royal albert hall so we were working inside the building so you our hotel the royal albert hall website we did like the Made, this might have been 2008 or something i might i think maybe wow when you but, did you get to go see any shows there it's like a legendary place we did i got to see i got to see madness played a, a cancer benefit show they reunited and so i saw madness play that's amazing i did i saw i saw a lot of sound checks i saw lou reed doing a sound check I saw Brian Wilson do a sound check. I saw Paul Weller do a sound check. Whoa. I saw um, there was a cancer. Was your inner 13 year old just like, what the fuck? Yeah. And you know where I saw him from? The King or the Queen's booth. Really? Yeah. Cause, cause Royal Albert Hall is like the more theater or something, you know, it's right. not like, you know, you think of it, you see pictures of it and it's like, you know, it's amazing, but it's a, it's a theater. It's a used, used building that hasn't, been redesigned or reconstructed it's an old fucking building so you go once you're in there it's you know so the queen's booth isn't like this fancy thing it's just it's the royal albert hall the the, the royalty own it so they have to have a queen's booth but the, i don't think any royalty would step their foot in that place you know <laughs> i mean, maybe they would i don't know but but so it was just this seat you know in the royal albert hall but yeah i got to see all these sound checks and then those were amazing because those were long. That would be like Brian Wilson. I sat and just watched him noodle on a piano for an hour. And then he started singing songs. And the Lou Reed thing was kind of similar where it was him just sort of playing and, you know, a guy setting up PA. And then by the end of it, 
kind of full song stuff, full band stuff. Wow. But yeah, it was it was what a killer. treat. It was nice. Was that the coolest trip that you've been on? Those London trips? Those were some of the coolest. The, I didn't like them though because I could not sleep. I could not something about that time zone. And London was not a place where I'm gonna go searching for weed. I didn't, you know, I'm not like I have to have my I have my passport and everything. So I'm behaving. And I wasn't a drinker at that time. I, you know, like later, later, I love Irish whiskey. I like, I really like, that's where I smack myself a lot where I'm like, God, I, there's a lot of whiskey I didn't drink in London, <laughs> but, um, but I couldn't sleep. So, um, so some of those times were not my favorite times, even though the experiences I had were awesome. I, I did them almost hallucinogenically kind of yeah the time zone the yeah the time zone shift and uh jet lag between the west coast and the uk is pretty gnarly it is you can't you get getting there you know like you get there at such a weird time whatever time it is you, you know if, even if you take like a, a red eye you still you get there and it's like everyone's chipper in the morning you know and you're crawling out of a plane um, I didn't. I didn't do well. Yeah, I, I I couldn't. And the only thing I could get, like I I would I would tell people I was working with that I was having a hard time sleeping, hoping that somebody was a drug addict or something, you know, and <laughs> yeah, would nice. give me some lewds or. But um, you don't make those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, or anything. But yeah, no, nobody. I think I've someone gave me some like tylenol pm or something that was the strongest i could get and i just i literally i really don't remember sleeping i remember laying in bed i remember my hotel rooms i remember every inch of them because i just sat there and stared at them all fucking night right uh, but the, uh through this time you you're still playing music so yeah, I still still play music, Pure Joy, kind of after Flop folded and I decided I was too old for that. I started kind of like the first solo record I made was this kind of acoustic thing. I was, you know, probably listening to a lot of Elliot Smith at that point. And he, he was kind of an acquaintance, someone I knew, someone I'd see when I was in Portland, like knew all those Cracker Bash guys. And, and so I was kind of getting into that, like, hey, I could do this and I don't have to be like, long hair dude or what you know i just i just i was very dogmatic you know very an amp dude yeah i just didn't i like i would i i thought well i'm 30 i'm too old i can't do this you know just stupid stuff like that stupid right. thinking and so um you know but then pure joy kind of started playing again around town we made a record um and then and then kind of llama my band llama started and we made a couple records and then I did that thing with um, <clears throat> Rachel from Viz Queen. We did Coburgs Unite. I saw you guys at South by Southwest. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. Where that must have been. You were playing with Loaded, I think. Nine. Right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Probably 2010. No, or later than that. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because we were on our second record, I think. Yeah. But that was... But, that was great it was i think i saw a lot of shows that was probably my favorite show and it was probably the oh, most awesome. seattle people that i'd seen in one place <laughs> it, seattle included it was yeah. <laughs> that's, always, that's a weird thing about south by southwest you see people that you never fucking see in seattle yeah it was it was a lot those shows were a lot of fun the the south by southwest i mean flop did a couple of those early on in the early who 90s. was in your band who was in the band that performed that night the 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 coberts oh, yeah that would have been so that would have been me rachel singing i think johnny came down and may have played guitar was um someone on steel was it steel a, you have a lady on steel yeah her name was uh her name is um borkland mark Maggie Bjork Bjorkland. Maggie Bjork. <laughs> Easy right. for me to say. She's great. She's on what's that label out of Austin? Country label. 
kind of mm-hmm. that Nico was on for a long time or something. But anyway, she's on that label. So she 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 was it, that was again lucky. Like I like me and Rachel just kind of met and are starting to play. Barrett Martin was playing. He didn't want to play drums anymore. He wanted to play stand up bass. And I was looking for a stand up bass player. So so Rachel brought in Barrett and we all kind of knew each other. And then we started recording. And then I was like, man, I wish, you know, it's like, I love pedal steel. I was listening to a lot of Graham Parsons and stuff. So that really spacey, echoey pedal steel, that's what I wanted. Sure enough, who's in town making a record with Johnny? Maggie Bjorklund. What does she specialize in? Playing spacey pedal steel. It was just fucking magic. So I'm like, I gave her a cassette or probably wasn't a cassette. It was probably a CD or something of, of the songs. And I just said, you can play on anything. Just do whatever you want on any of these songs. Um, I wasn't even there. I didn't even show up for the sessions because I was, really, yeah, because I because she was le- she was learning the parts and they were comping parts, you know. I bet and you know, so she was she didn't want someone there watching her, you know. Sure. And so I'm like, I'm not even gonna go, you know. And she just and did Johnny record that? Yeah. And you just, can rely on Johnny to do a good job. <laughs> yes, he he recorded that Coburn's record and yeah. mi- mixed it and ma- and Ed mastered it. Um, but yeah, so Bear Martin was playing bass, Maggie was playing pedal steel, um, Barb Hunter was playing cello. She played cello with us. She's amazing. She's you know because she's like you hear cello on a lot of rock songs or something. You know, you know it's like something you hear growing up with stones and the Beatles and all that stuff. So you like, you want cello on a song and then you meet somebody who plays cello and normally they're, they're the kind of person who only can read written music. So they're like, show me the chart. And I'm like, right. I don't have a chart for you. Just make up, play cello, man. <laughs> and that's not what they do. So I made a couple cello players very mad at me early in, in my music career, but, but um, Barb, is like uh, you can jam with Barb. She she she's awesome. She would love a chart if you had one. You, she would pat you on the back and say thank you. You're awesome. She doesn't. Like I don't. Anyone. Right and and um, but I I don't even give her charts. I just give her the songs and she comes up with these haunting cello melodies. It's just insane. Still playing on your recordings. She played on a couple recordings that I put out in like 2013 and anything after 2015, but it, nothing after that. I've, I'll still play with her on occasion. We've played shows no. in the last few years together. She comes out to the island and we'll play shows. We'll play acoustic shows out here, um, you know, at cafes and stuff like that. But um yeah, so that you know, another band that I let dissolve <laughs> <laughs> that you I didn't know. pay any attention to. Yeah, well, what are you supposed to do? Everything? You can't, yes, apparently, so. yes, you do. And those people who have, who play with the same people, you know, like Tom Petty did, or you know, those people. They did everything. They probably knew how to keep a group of people happy together. And right. he probably would contact them. And, you know, I, th- I think about like flop, you know, it was, it was totally pre-internet. So, you know, I, so we're not going to be texting each other every day anyway, but still I would, I would pick we, up a phone and call someone. Yeah. We would rarely call each other and we would call each other if we had to organize a practice or something. And we started out as this gang of, you know we just go egging cars and stuff seriously and <laughs> <That was laughs> we, we would do stuff like we went up on top i had um what was the the ambassador apartments in seattle like right on right where right where oh shit stewart street and john street meet up on capitol hill you know like yeah. there's a super cuts there and a hamburger place and yeah. so i lived in this apartment we went up on the roof and we, we throw a there was a like a hamburger Mary's across the street or something that had yep. those big old oval things skylights above the kitchen and we just go toss eggs and just bam 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 <laughs> and then like some guy come out with his apron and be, be, be pissed off and we'd be giggling and then we'd, we'd go inside we'd do it again and 
and then cops started showing up and so we were so brazen there was one time the last thing we did was we filled a we filled a ladle with lighter fluid and we put a egg in it and kind of soaked it and then we set it all on fire and there's the cop car is right below us because they were on this side of the street and we let the flying egg go on top of the cop car and then ran back into my apartment and so you shook. Threw a burning egg at a cop. <laughs> and then we just shook all night, like, oh my God. <laughs> They're gonna get it. <laughs> Pass me the bong. Yeah, exactly. And then watched a, a VHS movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was that was flop that was before we were named flop that was what we would do (laughs) then we named ourselves flop and kind of like kind of like a tv show it's like okay okay now we're banned you pick an instrument and right and then we're a band i remember i think kim maybe Mm -hmm. someone it might have even been johnny when we were recording that first Nevada Bachelors record, him saying, you guys remind me a lot of flop. And I remember, I didn't know who you guys were at the time. And I was just like, it's like some fucking old band. Fuck that. We're not anything <laughs> like some fucking old band. We're, we are our own band. We don't sound like nobody. <laughs> I remember taking Especially some and, old well, yeah, he was probably just, I bet you he was just, you know, relating to the fact that you guys had songs, you know, because Rob is yeah, a yeah, songwriter, you know. Yeah, 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 you guys write songs. Uh, I remember taking great offense and then I then I heard Flop and I was like, oh, this is actually really good. I think it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually I, a compliment. I couldn't listen to Flop until just recently. Like that whole thing... I saw it as a big cartoon for some reason for a long time. And now I can kind of go back and listen to it. And especially Bill. Weed, Bill. Right. Yeah, Bill. We, Weed. Yeah, Bill, uh, the playing. Bill and Nate's playing. I love to this day. Like now when I listen to those songs, if I do, it's those guys that I'm listening to. Especially Bill. Bill's parts. You know, but. But yeah. It's, um. That, they were we were okay band. Nate was a, an astonishing drummer. So if you could write a tune, like that was I think the secret. Like if you could just write a tune and had a drummer that was kick ass, like right. you have a band. You could play. You could hit a spoon on your head on your forehead. Or you could. This is a could, this is a subject that is touched upon a lot in my conversations on this podcast, and that is that you have to have a good drummer. If your drummer sucks, then your band sucks. Yeah. End of story. Yep. Because your band sounds terrible because your band sounds out of time if the drummer sounds out of time. Everyone sounds out of time. And And your band can suck. And if your drummer is killer, your band is at least okay. Right. You're like, if, if you're smart, you're going, listen to that fucking drummer. And even if you're not, if you're just like music, you're like, this is rocking because the drummer's holding it down. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I believe in drummers. As being a drummer, I guess. I think that's part of my problem. A drummer. <laughs> what problem? <laughs> what problem? No, we haven't touched on my problem. <laughs> uh, what about now? I haven't heard Llama. Llama. Llama, a rock band? Yeah, listen to Llama. They're kind of hard to find a little bit because there was another band called Llama, I think from down south somewhere. And they kind of, they it mixes up a little online, you know, you go to Spotify. Um, But yeah, they can listen just on Spotify and stuff. Um, There are a couple of, you know what? There are, Spotify will, because I'll follow a few, I follow Zeke, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, there's some fucking trap beat, crunky hip hop artist called Zeke. And every once in a while, I'll get a notice and it will say, Zeke just released a new single and I'll get all excited. 
and then uh, I'll go and I'll push play and it'll and it's just really really disappointing yeah yeah that's um and the, yeah. the well, disappointing there's speaking also, of llama there's, <laughs> a, <laughs> there's also a bad uh hip-hop band called the Hulk, the cult i think oh really yeah, i don't know yeah. how you get away with that i don't know and and you know and spotify doesn't really do a great job or itunes doesn't do a great job sometimes of of separating them and not and not having some kind of avenue to contact them to let them know even you right. know make a correction yeah it's so um it's just there's so much gauze blur and <laughs> curtains of logging in and remind me to start a band called blur actually blur yeah you could now right it's been I, a long i don't time. know i mean if fucking zeke if you can have a band called zeke or a band called the cult or a band called llama then why can't i have a band called blur well, if you're going to call yourself Blur, I'm going to call myself the Beatles. <laughs> you should call yourself Oasis and we'll have, Oasis. We'll have beat. Oasis has a new release this week. Yeah. <laughs> Home recorded. Oasis and the Blur both released singles this week, uh, oh, disparaging we each other. And uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is how we're going to create some sensationalism. Yes, that would work. Thank that would work. There was a, a some dumb internet interview with Liam <laughs> um, walking through a park, answering some questions, and it was pretty funny when he said, "They they were like, what do you you know? What's your um, wh what do you hate? What music do you hate the most?" And he goes, "Blur." And then the next question is like, "What's your guilty pleasure?" And he goes, "Blur." <laughs> and i thought that was pretty like that was pretty good you know that is pretty good that guy anyway huh from that guy right <laughs> <laughs> those guys are knuckleheads yeah i think so they had a few good songs yeah i kind of missed the whole oasis period because i was so anti big rock right then you're or not even not, i don't know what i was i was probably recovering from being in a band right. or something you know because we did it wrong <clears throat> we were a lot you were learning how to code also yeah yeah <laughs> well we were introverts you know which introverts being in a band you know like when you you know it's an odd thing and a common thing, I think, kind of the 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 mix of being an introvert and and being a extrovert, uh, some weird combinations when you are playing, especially right. rock music, which requires a little bravado. Yes, well, that you can put on an act. You know, you can you can become a character. Yeah, yeah, I. I thought that that was terrible. I used to think that was a terrible thing. Like I thought people were real. I thought fucking Johnny Rotten was real. I thought because Sid Vicious was real. He couldn't play his instrument and he died and he killed someone and he was on drugs and like not that not to romance. Although that's you know of course you're romanticizing it. Like but you know I, I thought things had to be for real i loved stuff that was for real and even when people were doing stuff that now i look back and people were fucking cartoon characters themselves you know ian mcculloch and echo and the bunny man perfect cartoon character but right. i you know you i show at the paramount who and echo and the bunny man Oh, no, I, I would go see them. Wait, I saw them like when they played at UW, you know, like Hub. Right. And stuff. And even at that point, it was kind of like, the, I think their drummer, they'd already lost. No, Pete DeFreitas was playing with them. So I, did, I saw them in 87 you know. and it was fucking awesome. But yeah, he was a character. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and not until later did I look back and say, and, and be like, that's, that's rock and roll, man. That's what Sex Pistols are. That's what Led Zeppelin is. That's what Iron Maiden is. That's what Van Halen is. It's, yeah, and it's, it took me a lot of time to get out of the you have to be 
you know, you have to be like, I got caught up in that early kind of 90s Seattle shit where it was like now everyone kind of lumps mud honey and Pearl Jam and everyone, and it's all kind of like all hippy Run. dippy. Yeah. And everyone, you know, and everyone gets up on everyone's stage and plays and Mark's singing at a Pearl Jam show. And, but when that shit was going down, like early on when Green River, like, you know, like all that we knew from what we heard was like, you know, like Stone and those guys wanted to kind of play better and, and, and Mark, you know, was more punk. And so Mark and Steve from Green River kind of more punk and the other guys more rock and roll. And, you know, so the whole, I remember when there was a point where um, Stone and those guys, it was kind of right before Mother Love Bone, and they called themselves the uh, Lords of the Wasteland. <laughs> and they were playing really? a show. I think they might have been playing at the Moor. So it was like Lords what? of the Wasteland, big show, you know, kind of, and it was probably something, maybe a lot of bands or something. Was and it the then, band just with a different name? Kind of. They might have been some different guys, but I bet it was Andy singing and I bet it was Stone and Jeff. Um, it might have been Bruce still playing with them. Bruce Fairweather mm -hmm. might maybe. I, I don't know. I, um, I kind of just know the like I didn't go see the shows, but like, all you know, just all the stuff that was happening on the on the social level, you know, it's like Mark kind of getting kicked out of Green River a little bit. And and so so when the Lord's of the wasteland played at the moor mark got a band together for that night to play at the vogue which was like two blocks away right called the wasted landlords <laughs> <laughs> really yeah and so it was that kind of thing where like people were making fun of each other you know it's like you're you're all careerism and shit and you know and people right. were like punk rock and and i you know so i got caught up in that kind of you know dogma of you know thinking people were cool and thinking some people weren't cool or whatever whatever stupid teenagers or stupid 20 year olds do right but the funny thing is is most young musicians at least back then no matter what you where you thought you were at if a record label came around and said hey we want to sign you you'd be like yeah great fuck yeah let's do it yeah. Right? Uh, but right up until that moment, you're like, man, fuck the man. <laughs> <laughs> fuck the man. Until the man we, offers me money. We even said fuck the man when we got offered money, which is <laughs> why we put one record out on Sony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, uh, there were many, there were many times where I stuck my foot in my mouth or did something. Some dumb you, Gen X slacker it, shit. Yeah, something dumb complained about something or you know being stupid being stupid being lucky was a, a real big factor in my life and being stupid is a real big factor so a lot of awesome things happen because you're lucky and then then the things happen because you're stupid um but yeah that was i don't even remember what we were talking about man but <laughs> no, no, no. i mean you have you're you're at home and you mm -hmm. uh I see an amp, I see a drum kit, I see microphones. I mean, you are, are you working on recordings now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always working on something. I mean, just to, the process of it is, is helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, try to play as much as possible. It's hard sometimes, especially now with COVID since everyone's home all the time to really just break out and try to find a cool beat on the drum set and play for half an hour or something. But, <clears throat> but I'll record at home. I mean, I record a lot at home. All the stuff I've done the last since, I would say after Cobirds, everything has been home recorded. And that was 2010. So anything I released after 2010, except for the two Llama records, which were recorded in 2005 and 2007, but never got released till 2015. Like, really? I just, yeah, I, I don't know how to do things. Like I'll record an album. <laughs> like the first long record was, I, I really like, that's, that's one of the favorite things 
most things that I'm kind of most proud of or whatever that I kind of came up with that like that just in a sort of in a in a burst of creativity and then along of course with Jim playing drums and Scott um, playing bass it just came together real quickly and organically and we recorded captured it wrote like 10 songs recorded them and it's just like wow <laughs> Kurt Block you know recorded it and produced right. it for us um so that was done with Kurt. And then the other Llama album was done with Johnny Sankster, who recorded and, and mixed that one. <clears throat> but but yeah, everything else home recorded. Wow. Yeah. Oh, what about mix? You said Johnny mixes them. I I mix them now. You do. Like John, like, yeah, I like had Johnny mix a song or two. And then, I mean, Johnny will do way better job than I do, but... Um, I'm free, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I'll just do it to taste. You know, it's like cooking. You yeah. know, it's like if I like it, maybe there'll be some people who like it. You know, I like the way the sounds now, and you know, and then I put it out, and you know, sometimes I can go back and revisit it and, and see how bad it is, or see. You know, I've learned. You know, like, like especially the stuff I did back in 2011. You know stuff I was home recording back then, right? Maybe sounds a little less like I wanted. I hoped it would sound than it does now. You know, so I've learned some things. But um, but yeah, it's kind of the whole process. I mean, it's funny that we're talking about this because I'm really all on the cusp of about to go the opposite way of about to get rid of all my gear, and and buy a couple new guitars and then just start recording live only in a in like a good studio right just do live just records do day. yeah just to do like have six songs and play them until there's a good version you know and it might not be the perfect very frank, version very frank black of you yeah yeah like those first frank black records where he was doing that with that lyle lyle what's that guy's name while wow. lyle workman was playing guitar with him and stuff and, and he's just like live to like it was even mixed live to tape right yeah yeah they would do down to two like, track yep. yeah like mix mix it at the board till it sound like you wanted and then start playing the songs and get a good version how and mix. they're fucking cool records they are they're badass records and knowing that they were recorded that way too like especially the singing, you know, that's the thing that always gets me like singing while you're playing guitar is pretty hard and there's going to sing flat or sharp a lot. Right. But Frank Black, a great singer. And he's got a swoopy style. Yeah. He's got his own thing going on. If he gets a little pitchy, no one's going to, uh, yeah. Yeah. No one's gonna, you know, it's that Boston J Mascus, right. Frank Black kind of thing. <laughs> uh, it's, I feel like, cause I have these, you know, I'll have fantasies where I'm doing that in my mind also, except that uh, I'm a shitty songwriter, but also it's Maybe like not. getting, getting a bunch of 50 somethings or 40 to 50 somethings together to rehearse to a point where they can make a live record is mm -hmm. really fucking hard. Yeah, that's like we're that, not we're not 20 anymore. That is a big thing in my life right now since I live on an island. Right. It's, it's even harder to get the guys like Johnny, like Llama is Johnny Sangster, me, Scott Sutherland, and Jim Honeycutt. And we the last show we did, the last time I played in a rock band was a show we did in February 2020 on the island but getting those guys out here normally is a pain in the ass so like writing new stuff and then having being able to play it and so i'm forming a new band right now of just people that live in the on the island and we have a place that we practice every, we can't do it now because of covid but we started doing it but we have a practice place and we're learning songs and we're playing them every week and getting better at them like the old old style way right. <laughs> where you practice the same people practice the same songs for a period of time imagine them <laughs> so that that's like a big treat that's a treat that's looming in the background because 
because that will happen if when pandemic goes away you know but Who's it's hard um scott stasic no no jason stasic on the on the island yeah, yeah, yeah. um that would be cool he'd be cool to get involved he's doing he's doing he's like you he's doing emt stuff now though he's, i heard yeah he's full on in a he's in a uniform and yeah. driving around at emt i don't know if he's playing much or not he was doing a lot of soundtrack recording commercial recording him and ian were doing some stuff but no um my friend scott how am i i'm i'm blanking on his name because scott bogan he's like an old friend of mine from the he used to be in room nine he was the bass player and, oh, wow. and singer in room nine but he lives on the island now so he and i and then my friend rosie who lives up the streets a f- phenomenal drummer <laughs> he lives like three houses down so we are we're gonna we're gonna break that habit of shitty you know playing a show and having one practice like that kind of thing i hate i hate doing that what was the name what was the old name the wriggles what was it the dwindles the dwindles the dwindles yeah are you gonna use that name i would like to use the name i don't know if the rest of the band will we don't have a name right now so that that's I'll have to keep that in mind. It's such a good band name. And we got the, got that, I think, because I wanted at the time, I was like 17 or 18 when I named the Dwindles. And it was because I was really into that band, Let's Active. Yeah. That was out of Athens. They like the um, Mitch Easter, the guy that was the sort of the brains behind that band. He was, he produced like the REM record. So we yeah. knew about Mitch Easter. So we started listening to Let's Active. And so I thought let's active like the dwindles. That's like let's active, you know, it's just meaningless. And I think let's active. I think Mitch Easter said that it was a it was something in a Japanese translation that he read where it was something let's active and he was just like band name. So he Right, it's like uh, Yola Tango. Yeah. <laughs> There's your band name. No one else is gonna have it. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to worry about Google and that thing. Yeah. up against some wall- firewalls <laughs> um i gotta i have to go man okay How it's ridiculous. late where you are well it's uh it's 8 40 and it's it's dinner time it's just okay. gonna be a late dinner it's been a uh, it's been a weird day i got uh yeah i've been coming and going well, it dumped it's... snow on us today too again Jeez. again how many inches you guys got uh, we got probably just a few but it came down you know in an hour or whatever it was just like, right close enough to kind of shut you down for a little no bit. no no that doesn't shut us down <laughs> no, I, I mean the snow doesn't shut you down in new york the roads yeah, are true. really really well maintained because you know they've been getting snow here for uh since snow plows since before snow plows. yeah or snow plows and so you know they're prepared for that kind of thing you you know seattle doesn't they don't get enough snow for for the cities and counties and whatever to invest in that much equipment and certainly yeah. texas you know those guys they they just got slammed and uh you know they didn't know what to do it was like the ocean fell on them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah. the world was turned upside down. Yeah, it's going to be like that down there for a long time, I think. People will remember this shit. Right. But uh, again, who knows when it's going to snow there again? So they're not going to, you know, how are they going to prepare? What, what Unless do you- those cycles keep getting wilder and, well, yeah. you know, fucking our summers are looking a lot more like California summers up okay. here. I, it's it's idyllic i think about that movie uh where you know it's, uh, i don't remember who's in it probably some you know older statesman sort of uh you know pro- maybe liam neeson or something or maybe <laughs> ben affleck is the young uh you know romantic figure of the of the senior's daughter or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, the global, uh, the fucking weather shit is out of control. Right. 
Oh yeah. Do you know what this movie is? I don't know what the movie is. It's about the weather. It's a movie about the weather. And it's like, well, this isn't going to end well because how do you stop the weather? You know, you're just gonna die. <laughs> it's not a monster that you can you know, you know, yeah, I, I, I see where this is going. But the the weather, the drama was created because like this, you know, like the ice front, people were physically running from it and it was like chasing them, like the ground was freezing <laughs> and cracking behind them, you know? <laughs> And they would like, you know, jump through a window and escape it somehow. Right, right. It's like, so well, that that that's not real. Right. They jump re- off a rooftop. They barely got hit by the icicles. They go through a glass roof. Yeah, exactly. And then they land on pool. a tent. It softens the blow. I recognize CGI anywhere. <laughs> that's not real. <laughs> that's not real. You can't fool me. Pass the ball. Um, Ask the bong. <laughs> Not really. Those three words. Well, maybe I love you are more, are more important than pass the bong, but <laughs> I, but they're pretty close. <laughs> we run we run pretty PG thirteen around here. Around, oh around. fuck! Oh <laughs> no! Uh, <laughs> with language, with with language, we're a double act, <laughs> right? But with subject uh, matter, we got to yeah yeah for sure um man i feel like i could talk to you for five hours but i can't talk to you for five hours no you've got a life to lead mike that's true but maybe maybe we could talk just for shits and giggles sometime i'd love it okay i'd love to get johnny over here like when it's good enough to where we can get a couple people in the same room wearing a mask or something he's cool with it i'll get him over yeah I should probably have Johnny. I should get Johnny on the podcast. And maybe get Johnny on. The maybe they. I mean, they're pro, they're that podcast. I imagine is probably doing pretty good. The. I think fretboard journal is got in the bill. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I and I bet you they've already got everything in the can for you know. It's probably a well oiled machine as you are. You know where you've. You know, I bet you we have only heard the first two episodes of them, but I'm imagining that they've already are. They've got a few in the bank. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, get them on your show. That would be great. It was fun listening to Kurt. Yeah. It's kind of fun listening. Like, like Danny Newcomb lives out here. I didn't, I don't know a lot about Danny because I'm like, like it's kind of that introvert extrovert thing. Like there are a lot of people in bands who kind of are shy people, you know, and that, you know, when, when you're in your twenties, it comes across as you're being an asshole or something. Well, let's but face it, Danny was playing in the metal room. And what? Danny was playing in the metal room. <laughs> that, he might've been. Oh, shadow, he was in shadow the might, Yeah. The, yeah. They might've <laughs> been playing at the grill gardens, but yeah. Like, so I didn't know a lot about Danny You know, I knew him and Mike went way back and stuff. But listening to your podcast was great because it's like, hey, here's a way for a kind of a shy guy to get to know his neighbor without actually talking to him. <laughs> you can wave at him and feel yeah, now I can wave at Danny. Yeah. I mean, we would wave at each other anyway, but yeah, I really. I'll make sure I, to send him a link of this episode so he you know, can have. <laughs> He'll get to know me. And- distant mutual admiration and appreciation without <laughs> any sort of, co- without eye contact. Without any eye contact. Yeah, exactly. We just heads down, both wearing hats all the time, you know. Good. Yeah, great. Perfect. Um, yeah, yeah. So it is. I, we never even got to my Duff story. That'll be next time. We'll have to do a Duff story, like a little interlude. Like you'll do a show maybe with Duff himself if you have an old. I mean, well, I know you've done the cap. I know you've done. I've seen the, the videos. He did the Michael Jackson one. Yeah, yeah. Um. But yeah, maybe there'll be a show where that can be like a little aside, kind of like in a magazine. There's a sidebar, you know. It's like this. This is the day it happened at the at the Bob Hope Airport. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> Jerry Cantrell was involved too. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's I'm making it sound much bigger than it is. It was, it was in my mind. It was it was a flurry of event because because of my state of mind at the time. Right. But. Um, yeah it's a funny story <laughs> it's pg-13 good all right <laughs> well um man i had a great time hanging out me too mike 
it's good talking to you. I, I, can't like wait, talking uh, to I hope that you, I hope that you are able to find the, the sonic space in your household to knock, uh, to knock it, knock it out of the park some more. And I can't wait to hear some more music. Well, yeah, we'll see. Like I'm, I'm trying to teach myself how to play guitar after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, no, I thought, yeah, I thought that you did in two thousand five. I uh, no, that's when I, that's when I kind of, like the the songwriting, like the craftsman, like oh, that's how you do it. Um, the guitar are you playing, learning tapping? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, no. The next, <laughs> I try to. You know, I try to be cool, but I'm too old and slow. So the next record is probably going to sound like a really shitty blues album or something. Nice. <laughs> nice. Bunch of Ernie's. Bunch of Ernie's. Yep. Yeah. Look at me's. Yep. Well, um, yeah. I'll let you go eat dinner. I'm glad you're only going to eat dinner now and not going to fight a fire. Yeah, me too. Because it's cold outside. I don't know if I mentioned that, but it's cold outside. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Were there a bunch of people at the fire, like going, like warming their hands? <laughs> oh, there's nothing. To, oh, on the fire? No. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, is that uh, we're in turnout gear, like you, you know, like yeah, the full. That's like twenty pounds of. It's uniform. a yeah, and it keeps you warm. But if you get, you know, I was running the pond, and so my gloves. You know, I had to do something where I got my hands got wet. So it's the most worst. People stay dry. Like but hitting I'm, your I'm, hand with a wrench when your hand's cold. Oh, or dude, something. it's the worst. That it's is worst. like because <laughs> uh, it always feels like you sl like sliced your finger open, even if you just like hit it with a yeah. toothpick or something. Yeah, like. doesn't yeah, I, yeah. Like I always think, if I'm going to be murdered, like stabbed to death, I want it to be on a warm, sunny day. Because then, then it's like you know, well, you know, that's that's pretty bad. But it's like if I'm gonna be laying there dying, it's like this is the kind of probably thought looking... that you could only have when you're stoned. <laughs> <laughs> but on a cold day, that's rough, man. Get stabbed to death or hit by a car, hit by a car when it's like when you're really cold out. No, it like, sucks. Everything hurts more. Oh man, because you're all tight. You're all ugh. yeah, yeah. You're like clenched and uh, hey. Way to end on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're great. <laughs> like I said, as a craftsman, I've come into my own. <laughs> Craftsman. I Listen, can say the word. Have a have a great night. Will you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, any photographs that I could... Have you seen these posters that I make where I mangle a photograph of you and then uh, yeah. you know, put... A to find one. cloud of pot smoke behind you or something please do yeah some make mushrooms it... some like dancing unicorns and so yeah paisley background uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. could you send me some photographs i will i will yes okay i'll write i'll, I'll write that down i'll actually write it down i'll send you I an won't... email i'll follow okay. up i'll be a semi-professional okay that makes sense i'll check my email <laughs> all right bud all right, Mike. Good Have a great night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on your podcast. It's an awesome show. It's my pleasure. It's, a, it's an honor to be to talk to you for a couple hours. <laughs> I mean, Paul Gilbert was on this show. It's true. Yeah, you've had some high, no, like some no. real, yeah, like real high rollers, man. Uh, there's been, you know, John Oates. Yep. I mean, to and me, I, like, I mean, I have a mustache yeah. now. Yeah. That's you know, because I was like, man, I got to bring this thing back. <laughs> did you and John Oates both have mush mustaches? I didn't when have did one at the time, no. Oh. I didn't have one at the time. Yeah, I can't go. Okay. Yeah. Let's, like, yeah, just keep, I, I was going to talk about mustaches Mustache, for another half yeah. hour. No, we got to go. Uh, right. Have a great night, buddy. You too. Bye. See ya.